I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I'm joined today again, Miles Neville, project engineer and senior ballistician, Jaden Quinlan. Guys, thanks for coming back on in such short order. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah, because we are one week out now. We released our uh, episode 50. Your group size, your groups are too small, as it was named, uh, less than a week ago, six days ago, as we were recording this. And the reception has been a lot better than expected. I know a lot of us, uh, between all the testing that's been done, we were kind of hesitant to put some of this information out because we don't want to appear like we're rubbing people's nose and stuff and saying, ha ha, you know, do it like this because we're all knowing because mm-hmm. there, you know, there are people in the industry that are like that and we don't want to be like that. However, this data is real. It's factual. It's, you know, it's irrefutable in, in most cases. So, uh, I'm glad you guys were able to put that together and we were able to get it out in podcast form and people largely seem to buy, to be digesting it pretty well. What would you guys say? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, just to reiterate, you know, that we're not the first people to ever do this. We're not the right. first people to ever stumble onto this. Like it's basic statistics. Well, yeah, it's, and it's not even around. a stumble. It's just like, well, we better dig a little deeper until right. things normalize. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, <clears throat> I was surprised by how well it was received, um, in my experience usually with males which there's a lot of males in the shooting sports that ego can be pretty pretty stout Mm -hmm. and when you rub against that especially when it's telling people making a judgment on their prior experience it can go sideways sometimes so we we try to be cognizant of that i I think it came off in the podcast that hey we're not here telling you what to do we're telling you what what we found Yep. And yeah, the response has been great in in my opinion from what I've seen. Yeah. The people that are serious about this sport and serious about hand loading um seem to receive it with an open mind. Mm-hmm. And uh we're not refuting the results that you have experienced as the listener. Mm-hmm. Uh we're just saying this is what we've experienced and this stuff isn't just uh trends and hypothesis. This is this is real life stuff here. So um, it's gone over really well. There has been some comments and, and questions and people have sent in some stuff. And uh, I think we're going to take this episode to take that next step in the study of why your groups are too small and uh, yeah, and just explore that a little bit. Now, before we get into any new topics, I think we should address some of the lingering questions from that first episode, episode 50. And one of those, uh, you know, Jaden, I know you mentioned it several times in the podcast, but we want to reiterate that the data displayed in that podcast with those visual aids, that was real life, pulled the trigger, captured the shot. Mm-hmm. There was no random number generators, no hypothetical data, no hypothetical velocities, no random dispersion generation. This was real life shots fired on a range. Yeah. 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 And there was some questions I saw about, <clears throat> how, you know. We, we said that in the podcast, so some people realized that we were talking about real data, but they asked how much. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that we, we've done, you know, the, the initial question was how many shots is enough, you know, so we started doing more and more and more. And obviously we concentrated on kind of 30 and 50 being kind of the upper limit of that last podcast of the data that we talked about. The reason for that is obviously we did a bunch of 100 shotters too, and we still do, um, but we we went crazy one time and we did a 500 shot group. And so we did, you know, we stopped it at 50 and took a bunch of measurements and then we kept going and every hundred we took measurements. And essentially what happened was once you got to 50, you had kind of established that normal distribution that miles hit on a lot. Like there was the sample limits. Yeah. The sample size was big enough that the, the normal distribution had established itself. That bell curve, it pretty much stayed there after 50. All you did going from 50 to 500 shots was fill in the voids. Okay. So, you know, if you want to picture is it picture it as impacts on a target, what you did was you got way more shots, you know, within one standard deviation from that average. So that the, the middle third of that group just became almost one big hole, right? And then you, you filled in the next third 
much more and then that last third got a little bit more filled in but it never kept getting bigger yeah that so the upper and lower limits of your extreme stayed the same yep. once you went past 50 so for the listener that's thinking okay well you've showed me that from three to five to ten to twenty to thirty to fifty shot groups it keeps the group size keeps getting worse like does that just happen forever you know yeah if i shoot all the shots like yeah, you is, it the, is it the worth. surface area of the earth is my group size you know yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's not true so what we're saying is when you what we have found is when you hit that 50 you've essentially established it it might get a little bigger you might pick out a flyer a yeah, couple you percent ex- here i mean yeah. yeah there might be one that shows up at round 397 that opens the group up more than it was at 50 shots but in general it's pretty well established by that point okay so what you guys established basically was the minimum number of shots needed to establish a uh, normal distribution mm. and yeah yeah to give a good good picture of the dispersion profile yeah. basically I, another important note that i know miles touched on on that first episode but i've had people reach out to me and ask about so you shoot a 500 shot group or 100 shot group or even a 50 or 30 shot group uh we take the 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 precautions not necessarily precautions the procedures to keep that barrel in the same uh condition for a group of shots um you know our our cleaning and round count methodology is very strict and the barrels are kept to that and then uh, we correlate point of impact with an xy coordinate so that's how you can compound groups on groups on groups on groups yeah i guess to to explain our setup we've got an accuracy fixture so it's like a pneumatic return uh rail gun more or less with a v-block in it and then all of our barrels are straight contour and so they clamp into the v-block uh, and when we're talking about doing a hundred shot group or a fifty shot group, that fixture stays put together, stays in the same spot, and we'll let the barrel cool down every ten or twenty rounds or five rounds or one round or whatever we're doing. Um, and at the beginning of this, I was curious, you know, what is the effect of temperature? And so, like in a six five Creedmoor and a six arc, uh, th- and this may get worse with like a Magnum or a PRC or something, you know, something like that. Um, but with a six arc and a six five Creedmoor, I did several tests where I repeated these back to back to make sure that what I was doing was, was viable. But if you shoot five rounds, let it cool off, five rounds, let it cool off, five rounds, let it cool off. And I do that for 50 rounds or 35 rounds or whatever. And then I go back and I just pound 35 rounds through the gun the results are almost identical. So with an inch 250 straight contour barrel, mm-hmm. with those calibers, your... Temperature wasn't... Temperature over 20 to 30 shots isn't going to cause dispersion to trend worse, worse. Just, because okay. of, just because of temperature. So that was one thing I saw addressed. And, and usually in, um, when we do these, we, we'll do 10s, 10 shots, let it cool, 10 shots, let it cool. And that basically nullifies any concern that we have for temperature. Yep. causing an issue there but and, it and certainly can oh yeah yeah, yeah. if you if you kept taking it if i did because there was somewhere i did 50 shots straight and you definitely start to see it somewhere somewhere in that 30 to 40 to 50 somewhere in there with a creed more you started seeing it there's and it's caliber dependent like it's yeah. heat yeah well, how much again heat? i mean you're w- dealing with a inch and a quarter diameter truck axle right and it's yeah. and that v block that it's sitting in is a heat sink as well so yeah like in a in a sporter contour rifle barrel like not, definitely not the same yeah you could you can get to the same temperature in eight shots maybe yeah I, and i'm not a barrel manufacturer but the the way that the way that the barrel manu is manufactured seems to play into that so all of our testing is done with a stainless steel single point cut barrel we have seen with some button barrels where it does move with temperature oh, and, yeah. and i'm yeah. sure some users have seen that especially like in a hunting rifle setup yeah. especially if they listen to this last podcast and they're going to try out what we said and they're used to shooting three shot groups at that hunting rifle and they say you know i'm going to go try this this uh 20 or 30 shot stuff and i'm just going to shoot tens you know i don't don't want it to get too hot um tens just enough what you may see is by round three, that thing's doing everything it has traditionally done for you. But by round seven, it's three times the size. You right. know, it, it, if it, you can use those numbers from that podcast 50, where we talk about, you know, the variability and the expected increase in group size. You can kind of use that as an acid check. You know, if you have a, quite a bit of data on what this rifle does for three shots um, and you start doing tens, well, you have, you're going to expect it to increase by whatever those percentages yeah, were that I mentioned. Yeah, 50 or 60 to 70, I believe. If you get a 200% increase in group size, there's probably something else playing into yeah. it. You know? Yeah. Well, and we talked about this in a podcast where we talked about custom rifles and, and Miles uh, kind of gave us a, a good uh, 
30,000 foot view of how a barrel is manufactured and as well as uh, Josh Clough, our buddy at HS Precision on a, one of our earlier episodes. Um, but with button rifle barrels, Miles explained how heat treat and stress relief is such a, I mean, critical aspect right. of getting an accurate button rifle barrel. Yeah, button rifle and, and hammer forge. Um, you're basically displacing material to form the rifle and you're not actually cutting it out. <clears throat> so... When you displace that material, it it build it, it puts cold work into that surface, um, and and you've got stress within the grain structure of the metal. And so, if you don't stress relieve that as a post process, then that's still there. And then when you introduce heat to that, there's a a stress differential yeah. in the material, and it wants to do crazy stuff. Yeah, weird awesome. stuff. Another so. uh, point that I wanted to bring up and address for everybody that's listening to this one. That was on listening to episode 50. I just have to come out and say it. You caught us red-handed. This is all a joke, and this is just a crazy scheme to make you shoot more bullets and ammo and make us more money. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. I forgot my aluminum foil. (laughs) Dang. (laughs) They caught us. Yeah. Yeah. Big guys. Okay, yeah. Uh, Obviously, uh, that's not the case at all. Um, And if if that is your takeaway from hearing us talk, not just specifically about episode 50, but any podcast we've ever done, if that's your takeaway, um, you know, maybe go find another podcast because if it hasn't come through that the reason we work here is because we're passionate shooters ourselves, if that hasn't come through by now, then, you know, it's probably not going to get through to you. Like, yeah, that has, it's not even in the, in the realm. Like if you weren't passionate about the study of ballistics, you could probably be a Johnny Pinchel pusher somewhere or back on the farm you Mm -hmm. don't have to be here uh, but you want to be here you want to come to work and uncover new things and invent new things and uh, yeah tinfoil hats aside miles i think has a nice form that he could make us a nice hat line (laughs) it with beaver felt yeah uh, because or an armadillo helmet yeah yeah armadillo helmet pretty yeah pretty solid option yeah i know and and there's a couple people that kind of took what we were saying the wrong way um and that yeah, the the shooting a bigger sample size isn't to get you to shoot more. It's actually to get you to shoot less. And <laughs> mind blown. Uh, what? And the, and the I think we kind of went through that like the you know the the getting jerked around by small sample data that says oh well this is you know this one's good this one's bad okay mm-hmm. well, well the difference between your let's just let's paint a hypothetical all right, right here. hypothetical six five Creedmoor one hundred forty grain ELDM Hodgson H forty three fifty forty one point five grains yeah. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that. Uh, but <clears throat> you're going to go from book minimum to book maximum every three tenths of a grain and shoot a five shot group and see which load, which powder charge shoots the best, right? Okay, so you got your best and you got your worst from a five shot group. But then we already discussed the last podcast that the variability, if I were to repeat each of those, is huge. The variability, if I were to shoot this, this load, five shots each, shoot it 10 times, I'd get groups that, you know, were this big. And if I were to take this load, shoot at five shot groups 10 times, I'd get variability from group to group that was about the same. And so what we're saying is that you can basically bump a grain off of the max charge and just pick H4350 with 140 grain ELD match. And the difference in performance from book minimum to book maximum probably isn't going to be that big. No. Um, and I guess we could get into a little bit, like you've seen the same trends I have, and that's basically that as you increase powder charge, dispersion almost universally gets worse. I think I have like one combination of things that I've tried where it might just be the sample size of, uh, you know, it might, I might've just got unlucky where it was marginally better as I increased powder charge. Um, Everything else has been either a flat line, a very shallow line, like the Hodgen Extreme powders and the newer reloader powders are pretty much a... There's a little bit of an increase in dispersion as you go up, but it's like so small that you need 50 or 100 shots to even see that it's To there. actually pick the difference. And then some of the, some of the ball powders and some other stuff um, that where it's just... Usually it's not a good fit for the cartridge. Those get pretty squirrely mm-hmm. as you approach, yeah, approach the top end. Mm. But so I guess my point going back to that was... If you have five shot samples that are bouncing around all over and you say this is the best one and you never go back and test this one again with any statistical significance, are you, are you really, you think you're in a better spot, 
but are you really in a better spot than if you just randomly picked, you know, somewhere in between, somewhere a safe load and, and a mild safe load and ran with it? That would basically, you could shoot 20 shots of that, say, oh, yes, that's, you know, three quarter minute or a little better for 20 shots in my gun. Well, just run yeah, run with that because happen. it's the difference between like five eighths and, I don't know, eight tenths or something, you know, 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 was the extreme spread from book minimum to book maximum. And you randomly pick and want it somewhere in between there to see the difference. Uh, I guess it's another point. Some people were like, "Oh, well, what's the point? If you have a half minute rifle and a one minute rifle, they're the same, right? You're just saying just load and go and lower your expectations." Well, no, that's not what I'm saying. Between a half minute rifle and a one minute rifle, yeah, you're gonna see the difference. Like scores are gonna be different. You're gonna you're gonna notice targets, one minute of angle targets or one and a half minute of angle targets that you miss. You know, with certain with one more often than the other. But the difference between a 0. 0.65 and a 0. 0.8 at minimum to maximum book charge and then kind of a smooth line in between, well, if you just pick somewhere on that line, the difference between 0. 0.65 and 0. 0.75 for 20 shots as an average of, you know, 20 shot groups. And then for you to see that difference play out in your actual practical shooting situation you're gonna have to shoot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah, of rounds not super viable so and and that's not to say that there's not application for it if you're shooting elr if you're shooting bench rest f class and you want to do an exhaustive test where you do basically the same load development schemes that everybody's done but you do a significant sample size at each one of those variable changes that's fine you can do that it's gonna take several hundred rounds mm -hmm. to pin down okay this is the best powder charge this is the best seating depth you know, if you can find that trend and it's there and with your chamber, your bullets, maybe it is, you know, maybe it's more significant than the testing that I've done. That's totally possible. And at the end of all that, yeah, five, 600 rounds later, you've got the best load for that barrel. Was it worth it? And it, it's probably going to be in that realm of a half minute or maybe a little bit better. And that's fine. If you need that, if that's the competitive advantage that you need, yeah, just, but go into that knowing that's going to take some significant effort. And don't go into it thinking, oh, I'll just do five shot groups of this, 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 and it's going to get me there because it's not. you're playing in white noise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I think there might be some, some value in uh, <clears throat> investigating why do we shoot groups at all. I mean, it's kind of plainly obvious on one side, but not so much on the other. If you really looked at the, the, the efficacy of it, why are we doing this? And, and is it doing what we want it to do? We're shooting groups because we're trying to quantify the capability of a combination of components, the ammunition and rifle being, being the higher level look at that. And we're, we're trying to, to quantify that because at the end of the day, we want to know the separation between what is normal and what's an outlier when we're out there in the field and we're shooting. So what I mean by that is, when we do load development or we're quantifying how good a factory load shoots in a rifle, we go shoot a group and we say, this group did that. We have recorded result. We take that recorded result and we, we use that to predict what's going on in the future. So I take this rifle and it shoots a half minute, five shot group, and I'm going to be shooting competitive long range shooting sports. And we concentrate on that topic a lot on these podcasts. And the reason for that is, is that's where the rubber really meets the road. This is, this is still a case for hunters. It's a case for three gun shooters. It's a case for pistol shooting. Dispersion is present in all of those systems, but where we see it Manifest. magnified yeah. is in the long range world. So when you hear us talking about that, we're not, we're not talking about that because that's the only area of application for this information. It's, it's applicable across all firearms, but even in shotguns, right? You mm -hmm. see chokes, uh, yeah. sa same thing. But anyway, back to that, that topic. We take that, that system that we, we shot a five shot group and it was a half, half minute. We think based on, cause that's all we know. We think that that is what it's going to do in the future. So we go to one of these shooting matches where the targets are a minute or a minute and a half, kind of common, mm -hmm. uh, steel target size at PRS or NRL Hunter or whatever it may be. And you're shooting and you miss a one and a half minute target at 600 yards in pretty good wind conditions with a pretty stable shooting position you miss a shot you go back to what you did you have what you believe to be a half minute rifle how is it possible that you missed something must be wrong and as people we're problem solvers right mm -hmm. and so we're going to try to find the source of that problem and we're going to try to fix it 
the entirety of episode 50, all the material covered in that podcast, to put what Miles just said in, in other words, is to tell you that if you do those small sample sizes, you're on such shaky ground that you can't discern the wheat from the chaff, the, the, the signal from the, the noise, noise, right? And so when that happens to you on that 600-yard target and you miss, if, if everything prior to that is based on a small sample size, you're lost. You don't know what to do if you want to do the right thing. If you want to find the source of the problem and fix it, you've got nothing. If you base it off of a, a statistically large enough sample size that you have a significant capability, because again, that's what we're trying to do is what is my capability? If I did a 20-shotter and it's 1.25 inches or 1.25 minutes, then when I shoot that one-minute target and I miss one out of 10 shots in my 10-shot stage, that's believable. When I did a 20-shotter, I had one round that would have missed a one-minute target. My group size was, you know... Just over a minute. Right. Yeah. So that was the point of that. And, and really what we were trying to, to put across to people is do whatever you want. But the person responsible is you because you made the decision to do one way or the other. You can try, you can try to cheat the system and, and do a small sample size and you might luck out and it works pretty well. It might be that three shot or that five shot or might be representative of how good that system is, but it might not as well. But what we're trying to do is save you the trouble and again, back to the end of that podcast, the time investment, mm -hmm. the frustration, all those, um, what we generally don't see as costs, right? We're so, we're so narrowly tunnel vision focused on how good does this thing do? And then extrapolating that to how good can I do with this match with this load that we lose sight of everything else that's occurring in that same window until the wheels fall off. And then you're forced to reflect on it. You're forced to look back and say, I knew better. I developed all this off a super small sample size. I knew better. And I was talking to, uh, I was talking to a pro shooter the other day on the phone and he said, you know, you should be careful when, when you decide to go to a match and how far away it is. And I said, well, what are you talking about? What, do, what does that matter? You know? Yeah. And he said, because if you do bad, you better do bad at a match that's close to home, not clear across the country. Because it's the worst drive home you can have, you know, because <laughs> you're spending 16 hours beating yourself up over yeah. the fact that you shortchanged the system. You tried to cheat the system and it got you. And there's nothing you can do about it at that point. What's mm -hmm. done is done. So that was, that was the point of that. Um, when we're looking at group sizes, we're looking at capability. How good is this thing going to do? But you, if you're going to be honest about that and you really want to know, again, you have to check your ego and you have to do the larger sample size stuff. It's, yeah. it's the only way it works. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to know uh, and you deserve to know, and like you said, you want to know, you want to, to be able to make the correction that's right mm -hmm. or not make the correction and to take your example and magnify it even further when you start looking at ELR type matches or you go to the PRS match and they have a long ball stage and you're tossing bullets out there like 12 or 13 or 1400 yards. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at a dispersion of three or five or two shots or whatever. Well, is your elevation wrong? Do you need to make an elevation correction because mm -hmm. you hit low or you, get, you hit high? Or is that within the noise of your system? If you truly believe you have a sub half minute system and you're shooting a two minute target at 1400 yards, mm -hmm. you know, it might, oh yeah, you grab the elevation turret or, you know, yeah. give it some holdover or whatever. Um, but in reality, you just opened it up even further. Because yeah. you made the wrong correction. You biased the noise of your system. Mm -hmm. Another way to think about this for the competitive shooters is a KYL stage. They know your limits, right? Progressively smaller targets as you go. And either like progressively more points or like a, a winner takes all type thing, right? So like you get points start stacking up and then you miss and they're all gone. Yeah. Because you, you got greedy. So Been there. So at a competition, a KYL stage could be worth 10 points, right? You might have a 10 round um, KYL. Like you get to the end and you just keep shooting the small one or something. 10 points possible. You look at the scoring breakdown of all these national level matches. 10 points is a massive separation on the top 10, on the results. Top 20 even. Right? Yeah. yeah. So is, is it possible that you think your system's a half minute and, and they, a lot of times they give you the target sizes, right? So you can make some generalities. You can convert this over to an angular unit, minutes or mils. 
and you can get a pretty good idea of what your chances are of hitting that. And so, again, back to that thing where you think you have the half minute system. Well, that last target on the KYL rack is a half minute target. Got it all. I got 100% hit probability, right? Should be able to hit that all day long. Mm -hmm. And then you miss it. Well, that that small sample size, again, cost you. That's 10, 10 points you might leave on the table if that was your last shot on that stage. You got no more. You can't start back over again, you know? Mm -hmm. So really, really think about those things because there's a cost associated. Yeah, on multiple levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing I wanted to ad address, and we can, this should be a short topic, uh, but some people have said, well, you know, I've done it this way and I am, you know, winning matches or, you know, whatever. Uh, I think there's something to be said, uh, you know, about a rifle system and ammo, almost like you could think of it like a, a race car or, or like building a motor, you know, if you build a motor with all aftermarket hot rod parts. Mm -hmm. It's going to run like a skin cat. If you build a rifle system with the best barrel money can buy, the best receiver, the best stock, get the best glass on it, you buy the best match bullets, you're shooting powders that are historically known for several decades uh, to be hyper accurate in, in any cartridge that they're put in, mm -hmm. you're going to end up by the sum of your components with an accurate rifle system and your noise might not be as noisy when compared to an off-the-shelf rifle or a hunting rifle. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, you can do some of this smaller sample size stuff and get away with it. And it might be more representative of what's actually happening than in some other instances. Um, but I wanted to bring that up because I yeah, saw that. There's f a million different ways. It's it basically everybody's got their own color of low development on the, you know, on the spectrum. And they all come out with something that works for them. And the reason, you know, so if, if you do it 30 different ways and everybody comes up with something that works really well for them, then the 30 different ways maybe isn't the reason why, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, why could it be works that out. You have really good components right. and really... Yeah, and if, if you look at it from that reverse aspect of the result back at the path to get there, you see that it kind of invalidates it. Yeah. Because if all these different ways are, are better because they're all different, but they all get to the same point, yeah. Well, so, then they're, the, and, the differences yeah. are irrelevant. They they had no play into the yeah. end result because everybody got the same. And back, back to what I was saying earlier, like from book minimum to book maximum, you could end up with 40 and a half grains of 4350 and I could end up with 41.2 grains of 4350. But then we take both of them to the lab and then it turns out, you know, we see this steady slow trend that actually 41.2 was actually maybe this much worse, but functionally between the two of us. Yeah, you can't we're see it. yeah. We're, you know, it depends on his ability and my ability. Who's going to score yeah. better in a match? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, semi-related, one big takeaway for the listener: you guys have done all of this testing. I think the single most influential thing you can do for your load development, and after this or right now, we can start. Let's let's dive into load development using the principles that we've we've learned for actual real life load development. What can a user take away here? Mm. I think one of the, the single most influential things you can do is change your powder to change your load. Yeah. That, regardless of powder charge, regardless of bullet, bullet jump, none of that matters. Mm -hmm. If you want to change it with, in, a, in a big way, simply just change the powder. Change powder or change bullet? Yeah. Those two things are the, the biggest influencers that I've seen. Um, but like I said, barrels have attitude. Oh, yeah. They're picky. They like some bullets. They don't like others. And it's unfortunate because I've, I've been in that situation where I bought 3,000 of this bullet and I want to use those in this barrel and that barrel says, no, I don't, I don't like what you're feeding me. And then it's, it's as simple a matter as going, you know, next, another yeah, one. next one down the line and, oh yeah, that one actually hammers. So, yeah. And you, you said, uh, you know, you talked a little bit miles mm -hmm. about your, your powder charge and dispersion and what we've seen in every data set, except that one that you mentioned, which again is, if one, we went back and repeated that one over and right. over and over, it may not show that again was that if you want better dispersion, you want your group sizes to shrink, but you're you're stuck into some com components. I bought these 3,000 bullets and I bought three eight-pounders of this powder. I'm invested, right? I got I to gotta figure this out and make this work. The best thing that you can do with that consideration is drop your charge weight down. You're going to have to sacrifice some velocity, which is against the grain with the way most folks do it. And I think the reason for that is most people are looking at things on paper. They're looking at the theoreticals uh, 
of, of how the performance could be based on what's known about those components. The ballistic coefficient of the bullet, its drag characteristics, the bullet's weight, the velocity that the powder is going to produce in that cartridge and barrel length. They look at those things and they run the numbers on a ballistics calculator or whatever, and they say, ooh, if I, if I can get 100 feet per second more, that lowers my wind deflection by three inches at 1,000 yards. That's valid, right? Wind, yeah. Wind's our biggest problem. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't consider the dispersion effects of that, that can quickly be eclipsed. And honestly, when you know we haven't done a deep dive on hit probability and what makes it all up, um, but dispersion is the king of that. So what I mean by that is if I had a bullet powder combination that was the highest BC with... 3,000 foot per second velocity. And then I had this other option over here that was a substantially lower BC at 2,600 foot velocity. If that slower, higher drag, lower BC system shot twice as good, shot a half versus one minute or whatever separation you want there. And that I will pick that slower, less efficient system because dispersion almost always wins. You have to get so extreme on your drag differences and your velocity differences to outweigh dispersion. Now I say that from the standpoint of the normal long range shooting we're doing today. There are circumstances where that trade-off starts to weigh more on the BC side and the velocity side. ELR might be an example of that. But from a, from a low development standpoint, one of the things that we've seen, and I would say nearly universally, is that if you drop your charge weight down, stuff shoots better. Now, probably the question is, well, why is that? And we don't know. Uh, I can assume that we do know that, obviously, as you increase charge weight, you're increasing pressure. You're, you're changing the dynamics of the internal ballistic cycle. You're changing the way that bullet releases from the case neck. You're changing the way the the case obturates out to the chamber and grabs the chamber walls. You're probably changing the bullet's interaction with the with the throat, the freebore, and the yeah. rifling, that transition from the case yeah. neck into being engraved into rifling. The correlated data that says do this, this happens isn't really there yet. But there seems to be something there where as you as you push things harder to the limit, your race car analogy, you you feed it nitrous oxide fuel things become more sensitive you're pushing things right to the limit and so another way to view it would be if you have a fixed percentage of variability in a system if you're operating at 50 you know 10,000 is your variability if you're at 50,000 that's less variability than if it's at 60,000 right that 10% is a is a fixed value so the the harder you push things if the variability is fixed which i'm not saying it is we're just hypothetical here if the amount of variability is a fixed percentage, as you increase the net value, pressure, velocity, whatever other metrics are occurring, the variability becomes higher. If the variability becomes higher, you should expect that the result that you're measuring is going to have more variability, whether that's velocity or whether it's dispersion or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So pick a good powder out of the gate, pick a good bullet out of the gate, and if you don't like your results, back the charge weight down. Yep. Yeah, And that, like I said, there may be situations where seating depth is something to play around with. I know a lot of people beat me up on that saying, oh, seating depth doesn't matter. It's like in my testing and the testing that I have done in that bubble, no, not so much. I mean, it, little little baby trends that, that could be eaten up by even sample size noise of 20 or 30 shot groups. So could you see it in your rifle with your bullet, with your load? Potentially. I mean, yeah. is it worth exploring? Sure. I yeah. Mean, it, I think that's probably not that it's my job. One of your jobs should be to get a uh, a barrel, pick a cartridge that doesn't have such a optimal, I'm going to call it, uh, chamber dimension. You know, when you look at the cartridges that Miles and you have done so much testing on, the 6 Arc, the 6 Creedmoor, the 6 5 Creedmoor. I mean, the yeah. standard Sammy Reamer is going to hand off that bullet pretty well. Mm -hmm. Pick something like a 308 Winchester, for example, just a standard Sammy Reamer 308 Winchester, um, and do the same test with a different manufacturer's bullet that has a much more aggressive ogive profile that should theoretically be way more jump sensitive. I'd like to see that test done. I think that's Do it cool. in a 30-30. We'll get a fast twist 30-30. 
could do that. Yeah. Maybe a, another little theoretical rabbit hole there to explain some more. What, uh, what the jump might be doing and the reason why you might see it effective in some cartridge bullet combinations and not others is that the, the, right, the bullet starting into the rifling straight is, is a key component to getting good dispersion results, shooting small groups. That's one of a couple uh, influencing factors on, on why the bullets don't go in the same hole at short range at 100, right? Mm. When, when you change the jump, you, you have to be changing the, the um, essentially motion or, or timing of that bullet as it leaves the case neck into the rifling. So as you put it closer to the rifling, it's going to get to the rifling sooner within the, the fixed internal ballistic cycle, meaning primer is the same, powder is the same, internal case volume is not different enough behind the bullet to cause a large change. And then as you seed it deeper and you allow it more jump, you are influencing the internal ballistic cycle there because you, depending on the cartridge, you're changing, you're changing the volume behind the bullet, which is one of the controlling points of pressure, right? So like in a handgun. In a handgun cartridge, if you seat the bullet substantially deeper or substantially further out, you have a dramatic effect on pressure. Dramatic. And that's because you're having a dramatic effect on the volume that's underneath the bullet in the cartridge case, and that's going to affect how that powder burns. In a large magnum rifle, it's the opposite. Because you move that bullet in and out, that cartridge case is so large and the volume behind the bullet is so large that a movement of the bullet deeper or further out doesn't really change the volume very much. So it's not much of an effect. In that case, what you see more is that the jump to the rifling has more of a, a uh, factor in the pressure that you're going to get or how the powder burns. So there has to be something with, with those jump measurements uh, of, of how the bullet is, what I view, bouncing off the walls of or the constraints of the freebore or the throat until it's fully engraved. So I could believe that with certain bullet designs, especially very aggressive ones, what we mean by that is a very long aggressive ogive, a very long aggressive boat tail, and then a pretty skinny or short bearing surface in between those two, because that allows the bullet to tip more. So is there, is there, is there a case to be made that with a super aggressive bullet design, with certain chamber designs, with certain propellants, that jump will make things better or worse? Yes, from a theoretical standpoint, absolutely. Have we observed that data? No, because again, we tested with cartridges where that's kind of ruled out of the system, right? We're using not the most aggressive bullets and we're using not the sloppiest chambers. The chamber designs that we're using do a very good job of keeping that bullet straight on the handoff from the cartridge case neck to the rifling. We did that for a reason, because we wanted to not have those be variables we can't control that are contributing to the data set that we gathered. And, and so that's, that's going to be ongoing. We're going to do that. Um, but those observations we've seen were done with those components for a reason because right. they're very controlled and repeatable. Awesome. In the vein of load development, this is a question that we addressed directly in the first podcast, but I, it was towards the end and I guess people didn't make it that far, uh, cause they were still commenting on it. And I've received a lot of these. Uh, knowing what you guys know, seeing what you guys have seen, walk us through again, how you do your load development. Uh, you know, Miles probably take the reins here for match rifle, because that is certainly your forte. Jaden, maybe walk us through what you do for a hunting rifle setup for load development to be the most impactful with the fewest number of shots. Yeah. Yeah. So match rifle, I, I'm shooting six arc or six, five Creedmoor, um, 6.5 Creedmoor for NRL Hunter, where they have a power factor 6 arc for basically everything else. I'm invested in the 6 arc. I've got quite a few components stashed up, ready to go. So I think 6 or 7 barrels now spun up, ready to rock and roll. So I'm set for a while. But uh, so, and, and in the testing I've already done, I've found that Varget and Lever Evolution are basically my go-to powders. Um, so... I've got those, I've already basically got loads figured out that, that I've already kind of found in several barrels past that, that work. So that's my starting point. I'll take 27 and a half grains of Varget. This isn't a bolt gun. Don't use that in your gas gun. Mm -hmm. uh, 27 and a half to 28 grains of Varget with a 110 A tip. And I'll, I'll seat those 30, 40 thou off the lands um, and go test a 20 shot group. And I'll see if, if the barrel responds to that well and if it is 
right in line with what most of them do, uh, then I'll keep that and rock and roll with it. And if it's not in line with that, then I will either bump the charge down a half a grain or a grain and try again and see if maybe there's something to be had there, or I'll, I'll bump over to lever evolution or a different powder. Um, and if that neither of those work, then I'll go to something like 108 or 109 grain ELDM. Yeah. Uh, I've even tried 103 ELDXs and had a couple barrels that really like those as well. So uh, that's kind of my go-to for that. For the for the Creedmoor, um, and I don't know, if I was just approaching a new cartridge that I didn't have that background knowledge on, I'd look around on, you know, see who's using what that already shoots that cartridge for powder and bullets. Um, and probably going to use a Hornady bullet, right? But... Uh, and then pick a powder that's popular and just start there. Find the top two or three most popular powders and I'm going to shoot. You can do 10 shot feelers to start off to say, okay, if I shoot a 10 shot group and it's a minute of angle, odds are I'm not going to like the way that that continues to go. Because the more rounds I pump into that, the bigger it's going to get. And over a minute is kind of like my hard cutoff of like, I I really don't want to do that. So... Uh, Sometimes I'll do feelers with 10 shotters. Uh, sometimes I'll just go straight into 20s and just do 20 shot groups and e evaluate basically what is the best of those powder options with mm -hmm. that bullet I'm trying to use. And maybe maybe I'll pick one and say, oh yeah, well that one was three quarter minute for 20 shots. That's good enough. That meets my criteria. I'll pick it and roll with it. Or I'll, I'll maybe play around a little bit here and there afterwards. But um, yeah, if, doing those 20 shot groups, I guess maybe you do two or three or maybe four of them and m most of the time if you pick the popular powder for that cartridge and you set everything up correctly you're going to have one of those that meets my criteria anyways. now that's a, what i was hoping you'd say what is your criteria for yeah. your match rifles my my match rifles i like them to be in that 0.75 minute or better at, at 100 or 200 yards uh for 20 shots okay yeah, in that ballpark. I'll fudge it a little bit. If it's 0.8, it's like, okay, I can run with that. And then on as far as the velocity side, um, w I guess we covered this a little bit, but I'll cover it again. From book minimum to book maximum, as you plot powder charge versus performance with velocity, I have not seen standard deviation meaningfully change over yeah. over that span. Using so, velocity for load development is a moot point and, yeah, and shouldn't be looked a, at seriously. A, after the fact, I look at it and, and I, I'll accept an SD of 13, maybe 14. That's getting pretty bad. I prefer it to be 12, 10, 8, 7, somewhere in there. Um, and that's that's realistic. I, I think the, the somewhere around 5 or 6 foot per second for an SD is probably the realistic like best case scenario for yeah, a large sample for a large test. enough sample size. yeah yeah um you, you may there's some guys i've seen some data sets from like f class and bench rest shooters where yeah there is a no no bs four and a half five foot per second standard deviation uh, i think those are the exceptions more than the rule okay not that i'm not saying it's not possible but uh, yeah not everybody's gun does that um but yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much pretty it. pretty simple. Yeah. I try to knock it out as soon as I can and get something that works. And then as soon as I got something that works, I'll go... Load them all. Yeah. Load, load, as, barrels load as many cases as I got. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we've talked about this now a bunch, but hopefully people take away from it. Yeah. If you're loading for precision, the best thing you can do, the single most impactful thing you can do beside getting a very accurate bullet that your barrel likes is powder. Yep. And, and, and buy a barrels worth of the same lot of components if you can i know that's financially not the case for everybody you know this is a hobby it's for fun but if yeah if you have the ability to buy a barrel's worth of components of the same lot components uh and that'll that cuts down on the little changes Small and nuances. changes and variables and stuff that you run into that make you like what the what's yeah. going on here like yeah yep and i think one uh note i want to make before Jaden talks about doing load development for a hunting rifle when we talk about uh, sample size, you know, we're talking 20s, 30s, 50s. For us at Hornady, one of the reasons I, and I'm assuming you and everybody else here that is in this game, shoot a 20 rather than a 30 uh, is the, the accuracy uh, fixture that we have in our tunnel when you shoot from the shoulder will take, it will capture 20 shots. If you want to do more than that, you have to start a new test and you can capture another 20. Right. Then you can go back in and excel and take all the X, Y coordinates of the accuracy and dump them in and get your, you know, composite group. That's just an extra step for me. 20 shots is going to show, you know, what I need to know 
and I don't have to do any extra work. Yeah. I can do shoot twenty yeah. in a track. Th- there's definitely still noise at twenty, uh, but I think I've basically decided that the noise level has narrowed down enough that twenty shots is going to show me what what give me a, a good picture. It's yeah. not it's not the high def four K, but yeah. it's like the but we're also shooting plate matches here. If right. we were F class, if we were the bench rest guy, if we were yeah. shooting, you know, a lot of ELR, that would certainly right. change. But for plate matches and for practical long range yeah. shooting. And for testing to find like the best load, I've done it. Um, and, and what I did was use 20 shotters as feelers and then go back and verify with 35s or 50s what the, okay. be, the best performing load. Got it. So, Jaden, over to you. Uh, and then again, I know you did this whole thing on the first podcast, but uh, now for the listeners and the people that wrote in, walk us through, you got a hunting rifle, precision instrument, and how do you get it set up? Sure. Um, same starting methodologies that Miles said. Pick a powder that has a reputation. There's reason that people use it. And, and depending on the type of hunting you're going to do, right? If you're, you need to define the, the, the longest line of, you know, what's your, what's your cutoff line of capability? How far out are you capable? Well, some of that's going to be answered by, well, it depends on how this loads developed, right? It depends on how good this system shoots is going to define that capability. Understood. But you as a shooter have a capability, you know, are you savvy enough, current enough, trained enough, have enough experience <clears throat> that you can ethically take a shot at four or five, 600 or whatever that those distances are. Figure, figure that out, figure out what that line is. Once you figure that out, that defines the job, right? We know that we need we need to be able to hunt uh, between muzzle and that distance. From there, you need to pick bullets that are going to do that job. And obviously, there's a spectrum, right? There's the the high efficiency spectrum of high BC bullets, and then on the other opposing side of that is lower BC bullets. What you need to look at there is from the manufacturer. They should put this information out. We try to be good about this, but if you're not using one of our bullets, you need to contact that manufacturer and ask them what is the what is the bottom end velocity that this desi- this bullet is designed to work at? Then, once you have that number, you need to run a ballistics calculator with that bullet and go see how does what muzzle velocity do you need so that your retained velocity downrange will will be adequate at your your uh, cutoff from a capability standpoint, right? So let's just pick a number six hundred just to throw something out there. I run the ballistics calculator. And I start adjusting muzzle velocity until at 600 yards, the velocity is higher, equal to or higher than what the manufacturer has stated that bullet needs to work terminally. Okay. There's your muzzle velocity number, right? That's the minimum. We just said that, you know, we haven't really seen a case where higher velocity shoots better. It might shoot just as good. It might not change. You could be all over the velocity spectrum and accuracy is the same or dispersion is the same the whole time. Um, but in general, it's usually better if you back off. So you've now identified the minimum velocity. This is your starting point, right? If if I'm limited on components and, and resources, I want to get to the best solution the fastest. I don't want to waste time testing a bunch of stuff. So we just told you all the data that we've gathered through thousands of rounds of real data, not hypothetical stuff, says that if you lower your charge weight, stuff shoots better. So let's start there. We have the minimum velocity we need for terminal performance. Now we go to a reloading handbook and we look at powders that will give us that velocity. Of those powders that will give you that velocity, you know, there's probably three or four that you're going to find. Go do research on those if you if you don't already know and figure out which ones are used in the precision world. There's a reason that they are. If those powders are available, try to get again, don't don't try to cheat the system, you know. Those powders are probably going to be more expensive than some of the other powders that are out there. You might be able to find a cheaper alternative that gets you the same velocity. But that's not a powder that's commonly used in, in those precision high demand circles. You're probably going to pay for that at some point, right? So buy the good powder. Go assemble your components. Again, magazine requirements are required, so make sure it fits in the magazine. And then I think I said this on the last podcast, but as you begin to test that load, test it the way you're going to use it. Because let's say you have a, a button rifled barrel that wasn't stress relieved properly, and, and after the second shot the barrel's warmed up enough that the third shot starts to go wild test it like you're going to use it so you understand those capabilities if you again i said in the hunting example on the last podcast that i cut mine off at three shots that if i am in a hunting situation and i have to shoot more than that then i shouldn't be out there what i meant by that statement was is there a circumstance where you could have to shoot a fourth shot yeah certainly things are unpredictable they go wrong 
that's it that's an extreme case three three should be it repeat that three shot test and and i think somebody had asked well should i do it all on one day or different days do it on different days you hunt on different days when i say do it the way you're going to use it like to the t mm -hmm. right so what i do is i i luckily have a hundred yard range at home and so i'll take my rifle out in the morning and set it there and let it get really cold just like it's going to be on a hunting hunting morning I shoot three shots and then I let it, let it sit there. And then I'll come back at noon and shoot three more and then come back in the evening and shoot three more. And then the next day I'll do it again and I'll do it again until I hit my 20 or 30 sample size. I've now done a simulation of how I'm going to use that system with this load and I can then see how it's going to perform and I have a really good idea of what it's going to do. Again, if I don't get the results that I want and you should, um, you should define that yourself. What's the dispersion limit you're willing to tolerate? That depends on what you're hunting, the ranges you're going to hunt it at, what your capabilities are, how how is the environment going to affect that, the winds, all that kind of stuff. It either passes that criteria or not, but it's up to you to set it. Um, if if it doesn't pass that, then I try to change one of the components, whatever one's the most obvious to change. Well, this bullet was the best bullet, um, let's say aerodynamically and terminal performance-wise, and then there's one that's like 95% of that. It's not quite as good, but it's pretty close. Okay, I'll change to that bullet. That's what I did this hunting season. I uh, The barrel that I had did not like the ELDXs I was shooting through it. I kept the powder and the charge rate the same, and I threw a CX on it, and it was awesome. Problem solved. That's what I loaded, Boom. and that's what I hunted with. So that would be that methodology. Excellent. So when you guys were talking about dispersion, I want you guys to talk a little bit about group shape. Because mm -hmm. that's something yeah. that, that really isn't addressed, but in all of the groups that you've shot, from a generalized shape standpoint, what do you see? The groups should be round. And that's an indication that small sample size isn't good enough because in most cases, the groups aren't round. perfectly round, right? Um, wind variability, velocity variability excluded. So this would be doing long range testing versus short range. If you're doing short range stuff, the groups should come out round. If, they're come out, if they come out strung in a vertical direction or in a linear direction, it could be vertically, it could be horizontal, it could be an angle in between. That's usually a, a uh, system or fixture related issue, a loose scope, loose scope base, loose barrel to the action, loose Bipod. action to the stock. Yeah. Something is, is moving in almost a linear fashion there that's causing you to have that, that type of stringing. Um, so if your groups are round, it's probably because there's a fixture issue or you haven't shot enough shots. And that's what we saw with those 500 shot groups. As we continued beyond three shots and made it to 500, the group just got more and more round. And it should because dispersion is random. The reason why a bullet goes where it goes is, is a random sum of a bunch of different variables. Yeah. Additive. Additive or subtractive or, you know, they're all over the place. And that results in a round pattern, a radial mm -hmm. pattern. Yeah. If you were to, I oh mean, this might blow people's minds. Uh, but <laughs> cross I'll put my tinfoil hat on. Yeah, cross section the uh, the dispersion profile, like the probability profile of of a rifle's dispersion. It basically looks like a volcano, whereas almost nothing hits directly dead center where you're where you're aiming. Like exactly mm -hmm. dead center, there's almost nothing there. It's like a, you know, like to cut the me plat through the dead center of the target, and almost never happens. Um, but then very quickly, the, the probability of your shot ramps up and then it peaks out and then it tails back down, kind of like a normal distribution, similar kind of shape, but it's skewed towards the center of, of the mean point of impact. Um, and, and so that's, yeah, I don't know. Another way to think about that is a traditional bullseye target. What Miles is saying is that almost none of the rounds are going to hit the X or you're not going to have... 70% of your rounds are not going to hit that X. Right. Right. But unless a, you have a really big target, a lot of the rounds are going to be right around that X and then less and less rounds as you get further from right. that. That's yep. that volcano perspective. Mm. And so like when we measure mean radius, that's usually just outside that peak of that volcano. Okay. Yeah. Let's for our last topic here, let's address some other ways or the ways that we look at group metrics rather than just looking at extreme spread um, of your two worst shots. Yeah. What are the ways that, that we're doing it internally here? Yeah. So for the podcast and explaining it to pretty much everybody, I still use group size because sure. that's what everybody is familiar with mm -hmm. and has always used their entire life. Absolutely. Um, more recently, I've been internally using mean radius and then even 
taking the standard deviation of mean radii, or not mean of radii, radius. of of the radii of each shot. So I'll take the radii of each shot, standard deviation those, and then apply that to the mean radius. And then you'll see once you get about 20 shots in, you can actually apply, um, you can apply, but you add two standard deviations to that radius, double that, and that'll basically be your, pretty much your encompassing cone of fire for that combination mm -hmm. of components. So, that, so you can get really predictive into what the capabilities yeah. of that are. So you know, oh, I need to make a yeah, correction. Yeah, worst I'm case next. scenario, like almost worst case scenario ever in my life, it's going to be within these bounds. And then that's, yeah, one of the tools that we can use for hit probability. So then I can apply that, oh, if I got a one minute, a minute and a half played it so far, I can expect. What's your probability? Yeah, I can, I can, and then you can chunk it down using that standard deviation in the curve. You can chunk it down and say, okay, well, this percentage of these shots is going to be within this. This percentage of the shots is going to be within this. This percentage of the shots is going to be within that. Uh, and that's something that we use internally just kind of to analyze capabilities basically yeah. and, and make some dis decisions for work honestly for bullet designs or ammo you know powder selection for ammo stuff like that yeah there's a lot of metrics out there you know that we just talked about uh, group size and mean radius there's circle error probable there's fom there's all kinds of different ones a lot of those are used by the government to cut it all out and, and get to the point what you're trying to do when you shoot a group is back to what i said earlier you're trying to gain a capability idea a hit probability. What are my chances of hitting or missing this target so I know whether this is normal or there's a problem I need to address? That's the point of it. Mean group size is is good at telling you how bad was it for the worst two, but that doesn't really tell me my capabilities, right? right. Mean radius does a much better job of that because it considers every single shot and it gives me my average miss distance. That's handy to know. Uh, it gets me a lot closer to a capability. What Miles is talking about with the standard deviation is really important. And if you don't want to go to all the trouble to calculate the radius of each shot, you know, from the mean point of impact and then do the standard deviation of those, you can take your verticals and your horizontals, your X's and your Y's, do the standard deviation of those two, and you can average those. And that gives you a, a, a pretty, good, idea. pretty good idea. What we've started to do, though, is we, we do almost like a bullseye target. We say... How many of my shots landed within this radius, within this radius, within this radius, within this radius? That's where your hit probabilities come from. So then what I can say is 15% of my shots landed within a quarter minute. 60% of my shots landed within a half minute. 75% of my shots landed within three quarter minute. And 99% of my shots landed within one minute. Now I have a capability that's scalable and adjustable based on what I'm doing. And especially in the competitive world, that's important because our target size varies, right? Mm -hmm. If you're shooting a fixed target size, all you care about is how many landed in one. And then you can make a comparative against one load versus another, or one bullet versus another. Um, but that's essentially what Miles is talking about, where he applies that standard deviation of the radius to the mean radius to get kind of that distribution. How many do I expect to be that bell curve, right? Back to that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, th I think that's where we're getting to, and I hope that's where we're getting to as a as a shooting community, because it cuts to the chase faster and allows you to be a better problem solver. Which, if you can solve your problems better, it saves you money, time, and frustration. Yep, beautiful. And that's like the method that he was describing is great. If you have a inch group here and an inch group here, which one's better? Because mm -hmm. they're not the same. Yeah, you can have right. completely different. You can have a donut. That's, you know, a one inch donut that has almost nothing in the center or, you know, or a low probability in the center. Maybe you have, I don't know, something jacked up bullets or something, but, and that's just theoretical anyway, it doesn't matter. But yeah. And then you could have them that's like all tight and then three or four little guys that yeah. busted out to. Well, and that's why it's so important to, if you look at just group size at your two shots of your 10 or 20 or whatever many shots you shoot, you, you can give weight to each individual shot mm -hmm. and uh, yeah yeah you've, you've you've loaded the round you've got time you've got the trip to the range the primer powder all that you shot it you just as well get some data from it mm -hmm. right and this way you can use every single shot that you've shot to help prove what's right and what's what's better or worse yeah mm -hmm. another Rather one that looking I'll, at too another one i'll use a little bit is the max radius what was the furthest one out because just because that, that one that's farthest out hit at the two o'clock location of the group, 
doesn't mean that's where that's always going to be. That just as equally could be at seven o'clock or, or directly right. opposing that, right? And so you could look at, at the max radius and double it and maybe get an idea of what the what the worst, worst group size is going to be. And I, I air quote that as yeah. I say that, right? Because that's yeah. not going to define it. Sure. That's another way to look at stuff. Okay. Well, this has been helpful and a lot more relaxed and conversational. We didn't have the visual aids, didn't, uh, didn't make this, you know, too math heavy. This was a lot more relaxed and conversational and real world application of what we've learned. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the listeners and the shooters take this and, sh and shoot a little bit more at the beginning so they can shoot less and have a more capable system or, or not necessarily more capable, but know the capability a lot better. Yeah. Uh, to, to limit the amount of uh, tail chasing. Yeah. Yeah. Test less, shoot for real more. That's kind of, that's our goal with it. Not, yeah. not just shoot more of our bullets. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Need some tinfoil on your head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I get my armadillo helmet back from the cleaner. It's the, uh, you know, the best, best defense against uh, all CIA brainwaves. Mm. The 5G. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, guys, before this devolves, I appreciate you guys taking even more time. Uh, to talk about the same topic, but it went over so well. I just wanted to hit on a few more things. And as always, we're going to continue to do more testing, more testing. We talked about doing maybe a slightly worse chamber geometry, something, you know, like an older design standard Sammy 308, for example, and something with a much, you know, longer boat tail and longer ogive and short bearing surface to see the jump sensitivity. I'd also like to see, based on popular user comment, uh, tuners. Um, you know, that's harmonics you know are a thing i mean cantilevered beams have frequency we you know that's that's pretty well established yep. and uh, i'm curious to see the influence of hanging weight off the end yeah. of your muzzle obviously we've all seen that we've with seen, suppressors, yeah. and, suppressors stuff, and brakes you but see i'd it, like to but... see the s tiny adjustments that uh, right. that tuners make to see when you shoot a large enough sample size are they are they impacting it negatively or positively or not at all um really excited to see that kind of stuff so with that guys thanks for for coming on and uh i'm gonna probably be beating you up here shortly for another podcast sounds cool. good topics to be determined awesome <laughs> all right guys hopefully you found this one enjoyable i know episode 50 was was really well received and hopefully this one resonates with you as well if you're liking the podcast if you're liking this content uh we'd really appreciate it if you'd consider subscribing doesn't cost you a thing hit that subscribe button we'd appreciate it and we'll catch you on the next one